we suffer the same issues. I'm sitting here looking at people I've been in Bible study with over and over. I've sat and broken down the word with them. I've been in church with them. And we, notice I say we, quickly will remember or not remember what we learned. Yes? Because we get our focus off of the Lord and on to the world. We'll do it this afternoon if we don't care. They got their focus off Jesus, did they not? And failed to remember, what are they doing? Why are you coming here looking for the living where the dead are? You should have been waiting in joyous anticipation that within three days after he died, he was going to come back. Why? Because he said so. What? They should have been waiting those three days in anticipation instead of mourning, but they forgot the gospel. And their forgetting took them to the tomb. Are you with me this morning? And it will take you to the same God places if you forget the truth of the gospel. You need to be able to preach the gospel to yourself if you want to keep your eyes on Jesus. You need to be able to preach the gospel to yourself if you want to keep your eyes on Jesus. And verse 8, and then remember his words. This surprising report and returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. What was their immediate response? Hey, let's go home. Let's talk about this. Let's think about it, let's talk about it, talk about it, think about it, talk about it, think about it. No, they went and told somebody about it. Look at it. And he would have told these things. But these words seem to be an idle tale. And they did not believe them. You know, one of the apologetics is a reason for the faith, and one of the things that people use is, is that the, the initial report came from women who weren't even reliable witnesses. So if somebody wanted to dream this up, they wouldn't have had women coming and telling people. They don't take what the women as being true in what they're saying. They think it's some kind of idle tale. I don't think they would have thought it was an idle tale if men had showed up. This was the culture of the day. Are you with me this morning? But God is working. They did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the empty tomb. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. What do we see next? Well, many people call this on the road to Emmaus. But we're going to look at it. The scriptures were opened, right? So the tomb was open, and Jesus wasn't there. And the scriptures are open, and they're fulfilled. And so that very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, and seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking to each other about all these things. While they were talking and discussing together, who drew near? Jesus, Jesus himself, and went with them. Verse, four, verse 16, but their eyes were what? Kept from recognizing Jesus. So in a spiritual sense, they are all walking and talking blind. They're kept from seeing the Lord Jesus. Is that not what the scripture says? And he said to them, what is this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? Isn't that interesting? And they stood still looking, sad. Then one of them named Cleopas answered, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? Think about that. Are you the only person in Jerusalem who does not know what is happening there? Everyone? He's the only person in Jerusalem who knows what's happening. Yes? He's the only person in Jerusalem who knows what's happening at the time. They ask him if you're the only person who doesn't know what's happening. He's the only one who really knows what's happening. Verse 19, he said, no. He's playing along. What things? As if he didn't know. And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, 
A man who was a prophet, by even repeated him word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we, notice, had hoped. They aren't hoping. They had hoped. That means they don't have any hope. They had hope. But the hope was over because Jesus is dead. But we had hope that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it's now the third day since these things have happened. Moreover, some of the women of our company amazed us. They went to tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said. But him they did not see. Wow. Think about that. We find two witnesses who get some background of the main subject of the story. The scriptures are going to be open to them and fulfilled. Watch what happens now. And he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. That's so important. We're talking about the Old Testament here. All that the <coughs> prophets had spoken. Question, was it not necessary? He's asking them a question as if they should know the answer. Mm -hmm. Yes, look at the way it's written. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And they seem or appear not to have any idea of what it is he's talking about. Ooh, here we go. Let me tell you something. Everything you ever learned about God came from the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit. So he's getting ready to do the work that the Word does. Because Jesus is the Word. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. Glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Woo. It's God against the rules here to get excited. <laughs> and so, look what's happened. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Now, I can imagine Pastor Matt probably thinking right now, what a Bible study. <laughs> Wish I could have been there. Oh, my. Yes. Now, we can draw a couple things from this. One, Jesus believes the whole Bible is about him. I don't, I don't know what you, and you think, but he thinks the whole Bible is about him. So we're walking, yes, it is. So when we're walking through the scriptures, we need to be thinking about walking with the word. Jesus. It's all working around him. It's all pointing to him in some way. To think through the scriptures without thinking where Christ is in the midst is missing the point of the text. That is what Jesus. I want to back up. Verse 26, was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? They should have been able to pull that from the Old Testament. But they didn't. But Jesus, that helps them to understand. Point two, Jesus believes our faith should not be rooted in personal experiences only. Too many people's faith is rooted in some type of personal experience. Is that what he's teaching here? Mm -hmm. No. He's saying our faith should be rooted in the Bible. Mm -hmm. What do you believe the Bible is? There's many people in the faith who believe that only parts of the Bible are correct. Or they don't like certain parts. You, yeah, they, you, you, can't, you can't take one piece out of this without saying all of it is incorrect. And so, how do you see the Bible? What do you root your faith in? Remember, in the reading in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it clearly said, you're either in one of two places. Yes? Mm -hmm. Remember. 
You're either in Adam or you're in, in Christ. That's it. There's no, I'm waiting to decide which way I'm going to go. No, you're either in Adam or you're in Christ. What do you root your faith in? And so when we see in verses 28, these witnesses are now enabled to verify the name of the person involved. How? Their eyes are supernaturally open. You can't see Jesus for who he is without the work of the Holy Spirit. Yes? Yes. Quit trying to do all of it on your own. Now we all do it, amen? How many times do you open up your Bible? Hopefully, maybe you don't do it, but you open up your Bible for a quick read and don't even take time to pray. Ask God to help you understand it. Ruh -ruh. Is he is the only one. You couldn't even understand John 3.16 if it wasn't for the I'm close to you on this gracious work of the Holy Spirit. It's grace that you know anything about God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Anything. I had a friend once. He's a preacher. Well, I have a friend. Not once. He is a friend. He's a preacher. And he said, once I got so prideful, I couldn't even remember John 3.16 anymore. He said, I felt like I was like, this is a Bible story. Like Nebuchadnezzar, out eat the grass, I didn't know anything. Because I got so full of pride, God had to take me down. And so we need to be careful. Amen? Their eyes were open and they recognized. So the junior of the village where they were going, he acted as if he were going further, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it's toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them, and when he was at the table with them, he took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And what happened? They didn't open their eyes, did they? They didn't also go, You ever done this? I don't quite remember who you are. I think, I think, I think. Boom, I get it. Yeah, I, yeah, I know who you are now. That isn't what happened. They didn't go, We should have recognized him. No, their eyes were open and they recognized him. The eyes were open first. The spiritually blind men, their eyes were opened. Oh, my. Stay with us, they said. When he was at the table, and broke bread and gave it to them, and their eyes were open, and they recognized him. And what did he do? Vanished. He vanished. They said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? It's like, bam. How did we miss that? There's nobody that knows that. I had to be Jesus. And then rose the same hour, went home, had a meal, talked about it for several days, and then, uh, oh no, I'm sorry. It's way back. Yeah. And they rose that same hour, returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven, and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed. And it's appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. Now their minds are going to be opened. And what happens? They believe. They believe. Think about that. Jesus appears in the midst of the disciples. Their minds are open and they believe. Let's walk along with it beginning in verse 36. And as they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. Ooh. Don't miss that. That's the first thing he says to them. Let's, let's slow down a little bit. And as they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and he said to them, Peace to you. Peace to you who abandoned me, betrayed me, forsook me. Do I need to go on? How many times do you and I, we won't even talk to someone if we have an issue. Let alone 
Jamie was saying, peace to you. Amen? But that isn't how our Lord Jesus is, and that is when you embrace the love of Jesus, you will also embrace the life Jesus loves. And that life is a forgiving, loving, caring life. It's a life of not putting yourself first. It's a life of putting others first. It's a life of what? Loving the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and loving your neighbor as yourself. That's the life that is being put in place. Therefore, anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. Old, unforgiving, bitter, all that stuff, go on, and behold, all this is new. And so Jesus, when he says to them, as soon, immediately, peace to you. Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened. Think about it. Free, full, and undeserved forgiveness to the very uttermost is not the manner of man. It's not it's not what we do, but it is the manner of Christ. That's a quote from J.C. Ryan. They were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, why are you troubled and why do doubts arise in your heart? When we speak of the resurrection, we speak of a literal, physical, or bodily rising from the dead. Now Jesus is going to help them work their way through this. How many times do you get frustrated with someone who doesn't understand what you're telling? <laughs> Come on. Yes? yes? Okay. Let's get over it. Let's keep working to get them to understand what is of the most importance. Remember, they can't understand anyway without the work of the Holy Spirit. So join God in what He's doing and see Him work. And so he continues on. What does he do? Physical proof of the resurrection. See my hands and my feet? That it is I myself? Well, touch me and see. In case you, you wouldn't want to check it out. Or like I'm some kind of, I don't know what, vision. For spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. Now, let's give him some more proof. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet, and while they were, and while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate before them. Spirits do not eat. Okay? He's a real person. He hasn't eaten for three days. I don't know. He, he, he's proving that he is the resurrected Christ, that he is risen. They gave him a piece of royal fish, and he took it and ate before them. Now, he's going to hold another Bible study. I've got to give him the word again. Here we go. And he said to them, these are my words. What? That I spoke to you. I spoke to you. Remember we went through the gospel according to Matthew? Three times he did that. They were probably a lot like us. They weren't good at paying attention. Yes? These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then what did he do? So that they could understand the scriptures. We get biblical evidence of his resurrection. Amen? Amen? And he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer on the third day, rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name whenever you think it's a good opportunity to some of the people in your neighborhood, to your cousin, to your brother. No, to the all nations. 
we get bogged down on so many other stuff than this, that this has almost disappeared. The good news. The good news. Now, what is that? Repentance. That isn't a word that we use in Walmart. We're not going around saying, hey, you need to repent when you're there screaming at the clerk because you've had to stand in line a long time. Hopefully you weren't doing that, but maybe you think about it. What does repentance mean? Well, number one, it involves confession. Repentance involves confession. You confess that you have done something wrong. Remember the thief on the cross. Remember, he confessed. It involves confession. That's admission of sin. What is sin? Missing the mark outside of God's law. What is the purpose of the law if we can't keep it? To show the holy nature of God. That I can't keep it. It's a tutor. It also involves contrition. You're sorry for your sin. How many of you have experienced someone continuously telling you for the same thing over and over and over, I'm sorry? Oops, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for that. Well then, you would stop doing it. Yes? It's a sorrow for sin. It's contrition. And repentance involves a conversion. And that's what I just explained. A turning from the sin. You're going to stop it. Please forgive me. I'm sorry. I'm not going to do it anymore. Yes? And so we're not at war with our sin. That's what repentance, that's the message. Come close to me on this. Confession, contrition, conversion. That's admission of sin. Sorrow for sin. And turning from sin. And what does the text say? And that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations. Beginning with that. Then he says, you are witnesses of these things. And so are you. You might be going, wait a minute, I wasn't there. No, you're biblical witnesses. You have the word. It's what you were talking about today. You've got the word in front of you. We ask God, hey, oh, can we see this? Or can we? And he says, that's right, I gave you a book. Read that. If you believe it's true, then you were there in a sense through biblical faith, your faith in the Bible. Okay? You are witnesses of these things, and behold, I am sending you the promise of my Father upon you. Who is that? Class? Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. But stay in the city until you're clothed with the power from on high. This is why we exist. To tell the world that Christ is risen from the dead. All the rest of it is nullified if he didn't rise from the dead. Why do we, and I do it myself, share the truth of the gospel many times and leave out the resurrection? Yes? How many times have you heard that happen? He is risen. Oh, I prompted you. He is risen indeed. Come on. That should be exciting because if he hasn't, then it's over. We're to be most pity. We're sitting in here and what we're doing is, is worthless if that isn't true. Oh, but think about this.
sharpest person in the room is about the Bible can claim no glory for themselves. God has taught them everything. God has given them the initiative to even get in the Bible. There's no room for pride in the Christian faith. Take some time to give God thanks for showing you more of himself. And then finally, and most importantly, where are you today? Are you in Adam or are you in Christ? I was recently involved in some discussions in the church about a lot of several things that are going on following me. And then the next day I was sent an obituary of a friend of mine who more than likely stepped into eternity as far as I know about Christ. And the first thing that came to my mind was, why are we wasting time on these things when this is happening every day? Every day. Getting the good news. Have you heard the good news about Jesus? Have you heard the good news that he stepped down out of heaven? He was born of a virgin. He was outside of original sin. Amen? Mm -hmm. Give me an amen on that. Amen. I'm going to preach with you right now. He lived a perfect life. He never committed a sin. Not only did he never commit one, he never thought of one. Mm -hmm. Anybody here think of sin? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you didn't nod your head. Yes, then. You just sinned. And then, how many of you here have failed to do what is right? He never even failed to do that. The Bible says, he who knoweth to do right and doeth not to him it is sin. He never did any of that. So that make that life available to you. So you can be clothed in Christ by repenting of your sin, turning from it, and trusting Christ. And then you get credited for that argument. That means you're in Christ. Amen? You need to know that. And if you're not sure, talk with Pastor Matt. Come talk to me. Come talk to people in this room. I'd love to sit down and talk with you about it. What are we doing back there? We're introducing people to Jesus. Amen? That they one day they might believe. God is good, amen? This is your time to be able to now think about what was just preached. And what was that? The tomb was open, and Jesus was not there. Yes? The scriptures were open and they were fulfilled. Eyes were open and they recognized. Minds were open and they understood and believed. And heaven was open and Jesus ascended. With the same body that he had here on earth, the resurrected body in power. What is your response to that? So I'm inviting you to go to the Lord in prayer. Are you open to the claims of Christ and are you open to the light of change the truth demand. Do you believe that they